we have been talking the last three, four hours, how innovation is coming from the private sector, from startups like you guys, from entrepreneurs, but why people in our same generation, also with a startup spirit, are trying to do a difference or make a difference from the public sector. So we want to uh, try to approach that from their personal experience and also how they have been working in foundations and, and, and governments to try to bring innovation to, to, to education. We have, we have Brian from, from Washington, the chef le uh, chief learning officer at the Washington DC government. We have Rafael who was more or less the same position and the secretary for innovation at the secretary of education of, of Rio. And, and we have a guy that has both experience in the US and, and Latin America, specifically Brazil, working with schools like the KIPP charter school or other schools, trying to, in a more public-private partnership way, innovate in, 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 this, in this sector. So I'm gonna ask them some questions to start the debate, and I want you guys then to, to jump in this uh, debate. And I think Rafael will show eventually a, a, a short video, only 45 minutes, uh, about, about his, his experience. And I want to start this with, with, with Brian. Brian, you think that innovation is the way to improve education. You are in bringing technology to the... But why you, as a person, as, as, as Brian, th thought that the government was a good way to do this? Why you thought the government are not a startup or a foundation? Or, or sure. why you thought that was the right uh, track to bring innovation? Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me here. Uh, in Washington, D.C., we serve about 50,000 students um, that are in traditional public schools. And there are three things we think are important. And all three of them we have to innovate um, from within and being pushed by people outside. The three things are the very best teachers. And we have been very innovative about how to recruit, select, retain, and reward our very good teachers. The second thing is the very best content. And a lot of the content we get now is from digital content, bringing good content into the classroom. And then third, we have to figure out ways to better engage our students, to motivate them um, and keep them interested in, and engaged in their learning. So uh, from DC Public Schools, where I work uh, in Washington, DC, we've been looking at all three of those things and using technology to accelerate the amount of change in those areas. Fantastic. And why did you join the government? Why, why you thought it was a good way to make a difference? Sure. Um, so, so I was very lucky to join uh, my current job in Washington, D.C. with a lot of thinkers who were, who were young, uh, innovative, and, and um, hardworking uh, to, to change what was happening in schools there. So it was very important to me personally to have um, a group of people, my coworkers, who began working in 2008, about six years ago. Um, we took over the school district to try to push some innovative uh, work there. Fantastic, fantastic, thank you. Rafael, you're tweeting. Listen, you were at the government of Rio de, de, de Janeiro, trying to bring innovation at the, the government level. What, what were your two or three major achievements while you were there? What, what do you think you accomplished in your years at, at the Rio Janeiro? Okay. If I speak Portuguese to them, Perfect. can you understand? Yeah? Okay. Bom, então, em primeiro lugar, é importante eu falar também que eu acabei de sair. Eu passei quatro anos como subsecretário de educação do Rio de Janeiro e olhando para essa parte de inovação. Né? É, e aí a gente tentou inovar em espaços, por exemplo, a gente, te, a gente criou um novo modelo de escola que é o Gente. Aí se desse para colocar até o vídeo para a gente mostrar mais ou menos a, a escola, não sei se vocês estão mais ou menos familiarizados, mas o, o modelo de escola não tem sala de aula, não tem mais seriação e o que a gente tentou fazer foi colocar o aluno no centro do processo de aprendizagem. É, e mudar o papel do professor como colocar o professor como mentor é, e usar muito as, as a, novas tecnologias, mas mais para personalizar mesmo o processo de aprendizagem para cada aluno é, e também trabalhar com projetos transdisciplinares e é, o que a gente chama de educação interdimensional, que é são as várias habilidades socioemocionais e é, de várias, é, enfim, 
é, todas as dimensões do humano, né? A gente fica dando muita prioridade para a parte das áreas disciplinares e tal, mas a gente esquece que a formação do humano é muito mais complexa do que simplesmente aprender é, português, matemática, ciências e etc. Então a gente é, inovou criando um novo modelo de escola que a gente, cria, que, a gente queria que ganhasse é, escala lá no Rio. Mas foi o primeiro ano é, desse, desse, desse novo tipo de escola e foi um ano muito conturbado, com, com greve, etc. É, e a gente não conseguiu implementar 100% daquilo que a gente tinha planejado e desenhado. Então, é, essa foi uma coisa que eu aprendi. A gente, a gente planeja e algumas vezes a gente é muito ousado no planejamento e é importante a gente entender que é, ampliar paradigmas e mudar aquela coisa que está muito entranhada, principalmente mudar a cultura, mudar a forma como as pessoas enxergam a realidade, a forma como as pessoas se veem fazendo o seu trabalho, é uma questão muito complicada. E quando a gente fala da inserção de novas metodologias, de novas ferramentas, de inovação, em qualquer área, mas em especial na educação, é, a gente está falando de uma mudança de cultura, né? uma mudança de percepção da realidade, de percepção do seu próprio trabalho e de percepção de... É, como é que você faz aquilo melhor. Então, não é nada simples, é, é bem complexo e é bem difícil. E a gente entendeu que para é, se implementar completamente aquilo que a gente tinha planejado, a gente levaria dois anos. A gente criou uma plataforma de aulas digitais que é a Educopédia, é, onde os alunos podem ver tudo que eles é, têm de aprender online, de qualquer lugar, a qualquer hora. E é, as aulas estão lá, então ele clica, sei lá, nono ano, matemática, e aí tá, tem a lista de todas as aulas, é, tudo que ele tem que aprender, e aí ele vê vídeos, joga, é, faz uma série de coisas para desenvolver aquelas habilidades é, específicas, acho que foi algo também é, bem inovador. É, mas é, eu acho que o que eu aprendi mesmo também é que a gente precisa, e aí para as startups e as pessoas que querem inovar, é, entender que a gente precisa se articular mais para mudar inclusive a nossa legislação aqui no Brasil. É, a gente sabe que a gente tem leis, entre aspas, é, modernas e avançadas em comparação ao resto do mundo, mas a verdade é que está é, muito complicado. E a própria legislação para a gestão pública torna a mudança e a inovação muito complicada. E faz com que o governo tenha muita dificuldade, inclusive, de fazer compras de startups. Então, assim, se a gente quer um ambiente no Brasil que seja é, um ambiente propício à inovação e um ambiente propício ao desenvolvimento e ao crescimento e amadurecimento de startups, a gente precisa se articular é, e movimentar para mudar, inclusive, a nossa legislação e mudar a, a nossa visão em relação é, ao que a gente quer é, e que, quais são as nossas estratégias. Então, é, fazer alguma coisa acontecer no governo é muito complicado, e eu acho que todo mundo aqui tem essa responsabilidade de é, pressionar e cobrar pelas mudanças no governo e na, na legislação aqui no Brasil. Thank you. Thank you. Are you going to show the video now or later? Não, pode ser. Pode ser agora. Estamos imersos em um mundo globalizado, hiperconectado e em constante transformação. Submersos pelos inúmeros desafios. Okay. Wait. Ah. Até hoje as escolas acreditam que todas as pessoas aprendem da mesma forma. Até hoje as instituições de ensino consideram que todas as mentes são iguais. As escolas olham a sala de aula como uma linha de produção, despejando sempre as mesmas ideias sobre os alunos. Até hoje. Gente, um novo conceito de escola que entende que as pessoas são diferentes uma das outras e personaliza o processo de aprendizagem, se ajustando às necessidades de cada aluno. Gente é escola diferente porque ninguém é igual. O projeto Gente é um projeto que tenta colocar o adolescente em situação escolar como protagonista do seu próprio processo de aprendizagem. Nós não tínhamos uma escola de sexto a nono ano na Rocinha. Ao descobrir um clube quase abandonado, surgiu a ideia de criar essa escola André Urano. E ela surgiu como uma escola do amanhã, que é a escola que a gente desenha para áreas 
ou conflagradas ou recém pacificadas. Um grupo aqui de dentro da secretaria se juntou com especialistas uh, em tecnologias educacionais e pensou, vamos imaginar um processo transformador com o aluno no centro, com o aluno protagonista, veio quase que naturalmente a ideia da escola da Rocinha. A gente precisa mudar radicalmente do espaço arquitetônico, como é a divisão de espaço, que tipo de, de móveis são utilizados, aonde as pessoas podem interferir de acordo com as necessidades ou de acordo com a criação daquele momento, num espaço completamente diferente, que estimula exatamente o contrário e diz, aqui você vai ter que ser curioso, você vai ter que criar, você vai ter que agir, você vai ter que mostrar quem é você e a que você veio. O aluno ele está habituado ao que na escola antiga, né? O professor chega, bom dia, a matéria de hoje é essa, essa, essa. Todos fazendo os mesmos exercícios, todos tendo o mesmo conteúdo. E aqui não, cada um vai estar no seu momento. Então este momento, ele não é igual a de todos. Forma-se uma equipe que está entrando dentro de um espaço totalmente desafiante. É um espaço de convivência, não é verdade? Esse espaço de convivência também é um espaço de aprender a conviver. É o que os alunos querem. É o que a gente quer, na verdade. A gente quer fazer, a gente quer acontecer e a gente quer que as pessoas entendam e valorizem aquilo que a gente é e aquilo que a gente faz. O aluno está precisando voltar a gostar de estudar, de querer estudar. O método educacional que a gente propõe aqui, incluindo é, o conteúdo, ele é bem diferente do que acontece numa escola tradicional. Em primeiro lugar, porque ele se utiliza muito das novas tecnologias eh, educacionais e das novas tecnologias de informação e comunicação, principalmente dos computadores, dos tablets, da internet e dos celulares, eh, esses mais avançados. Essa... Thank you, thank you very much. This is Rafael's video to run for office, run for mayor of Rio. <laughs> You have been you have been an entrepreneur both in the US and in Brazil in Rio specifically and in the education market. Why don't we ask how what have been the differences being an entrepreneur in the US and an entrepreneur in Rio? Is it easier? Is it the same? Is you have the same challenges? Can you share that with with us and with the the public? Okay. Can you hear me? All right, there we go. So uh, currently, as it was said, I live in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, before getting there, I was a teacher in Washington, D.C. and taught sixth grade. In 2004, I was able to join the KIPP program, which is a national network of charter schools. So 2004, I really began, began my formal uh, entrepreneur type life in education. And I was selected to join this program in June 2004. And the, the goal or the primary objective in the next year was to start a charter school, fifth through eighth graders in Brooklyn, New York, with 10 hour school day, Saturdays, summers. And I had one year to do so. I had to find teachers, I had to find students, I had to find board members, I had to raise money, I had to select the kids and train the teachers and build a curriculum, etc. So every facet of the school pretty much fell on my shoulders. So it was really important for me primarily, the first objective was to build a great team around me that could help me with this. And some would think one year is a long period of time, but one year to start a school, I remember I probably aged 10 years in that one year uh, from 2004 to 2005. So I was principal, the school opened in 2005. I was principal from 2005 to 2011. And throughout that time, I met some really nice friends from Brazil who are sitting in the audience right now. Anna is one of them, Aida. And they were asking me about some of the reform efforts that were taking place in the U.S. around uh, education. Teach for America, KIPP, how are we innovating so quickly and training teachers in different methods so quickly? And could I come to Brazil and help share my experience and share uh, my expertise? 
So who would say no to a trip to Brazil, right? So I came, I came for a few trips and then I actually moved full time to Rio in 2011. So some of the things that I initially noticed as, as huge differences or challenges or, or just uh, obstacles in the way were I felt that in the U.S. there was uh, a joint movement who, you know, in the, in the late 90s, in the early 2000s, there was a lot of upset educators. You know any upset educators? Raise your hand. There was upset community members, families, parents. Raise your hand if you know any upset. <laughs> Come on, you watch the news in Brazil. I don't understand all the Portuguese, but I see the manifestations taking place. People wanted change. And I think in the 80s and in the 90s in the U.S., this happened a little bit earlier than it happened here in Brazil. So the, move, the, mo the movement in the late 90s, in the mid to late 90s, was starting to catch on. And any movement, you know, you need friends in the movement. And you need people to join you and to yell with you and to shout with you. And I think this is something that happened, uh, again, you know, in the early 2000s, late 90s, that allowed for a snowball to just travel a bit faster. So when I got selected to be a principal, it was fast. You know, I was a teacher. I was selected to be principal. I went to a six-week course at uh, Berkeley and Stanford and the University of Chicago. I got prepped and trained in everything I need to know. I went out looking for teachers. I trained them. And everything happened really fast because there was a movement around it that also tackled the policy issues that might have prevented us from moving forward. So when I got to Brazil, I don't think the groundwork had been laid as deeply yet. So what I found in 2011 was I felt like I was back in the late 90s in the USA where people were starting to get angry. Parents and families were starting to look for alternatives and look for different ways to solve the problem of education in, in the public schools. So the charter school movement grew out of this non-satisfaction of what exists. And I think that's what started happening here in Brazil. So when I came, I was running full speed from my pace in New York City. And when I got here, I realized that there was much more work, deep-rooted work to be done politically and policy-wise, so we couldn't run as fast. And it was a little frustrating, but I began to understand the, the reasons why we weren't running as fast. And there's been a lot of great work done in the city of Rio de Janeiro thus far to, to you know, the program like you just saw and the uh, Schools of Tomorrow and the Jail Schools, which I'm a, a, a partner with now. There are a lot of movements just taking off. So, so even though there's a lot of differences, I think it's really very similar. It's just a different time period in space. Children need great teachers. As Brian talked about the first initiative, Ch children need great educational leaders. And until that is addressed, really everything is going to move slowly because with the teachers aren't equipped with the technology and the resources to teach on a level where the kids are going to really advance, then really we're just running like on a treadmill. We're not going anywhere. So thank you very much. I have one more question for Brian and, and Rafael, and then I want to open to, to the public. The, the former speaker, Marcelo Cabral, referred to in some way disconnected youth, students that are not in school and are not uh, working. And that's a big problem in Latin America. You know, he was saying 50% of dropout in Latin America. But in Washington as well, it's a big problem, especially minorities in Latinos and African American. How, how is technology, is technology a solution for that? Or, and how is you guys in the DC government trying to address the problem using technology? And then I want to go to Rio as well, Rafael. Yeah, uh, disengagement or uh, dropouts are a big problem in Washington, D.C. Um, in, in D.C., we have three sets of schools, primary schools, middle schools, and high schools. And we're using technology in all three to better engage students. Um, the old way uh, is, frankly, for a lot of students, is boring. It's everybody sits like this. They look at the teacher. You're bored. I'm bored. Um, I talk, and we're all doing the same thing, right? It's kind of the old way. We're trying three new ways in our system. For um, our primary schools, 
we mostly do rotations. So all small groups, one group is with the teacher, the next group is with the uh, computers, there are about eight computers in the classroom, and the third group is independent work. They're working collaboratively or by themselves, and they rotate through, right? Sometimes the students are gr grouped at the same level, and other times they're with different levels. In the middle school, imagine this, big room like this, and we all walk in every day. We look at a TV screen, and it tells us what station to go to that day. Some of us are on computers, some of us are working in partners, other of us are with groups, and some of us are in th with the teacher in a classroom or in a small group. And every single day, I, you, take a five question test in math. And do I, it tells the teacher, did I learn what I needed to learn today? If not, I'll try it again tomorrow. If I did learn it, I will move on. So now every student, 80 students in the classroom, are getting different stuff every day based on what they need. And then finally, at high school or our senior schools, we're trying a model where half of the class is on computers and half of the class is with the teacher. Halfway through, we switch. And then the teacher does the lesson two times and the students work independently or with groups with the technology. Now in order to make this happen, we need three things again. We need high quality content, which is why I'm working up with startup people every single day. LearnZillion, Mathalicious, ST Math, all these, these companies in the United States were smart in thinking about content. Second, we need great teachers who we train to do all this magic. They have to be really good at teaching and at running the new program. And third, we need students and families who understand this new model that bring some ownership to their learning. They are now owning their learning. What do I want to learn today? What do I have to get better at? And how am I going to go do it in one of these three models? We have to change from the old to the new in order to bring those students back to school. Right. Thank you very much. How, is it, how, are you, how did you do it in Rio? How are you doing it in Rio, Rafael? Então, eu, eu concordo 100% com o Brian. É, a escola já era chata, ela não se tornou chata. Ela sempre foi chata, foi chata na nossa época e continua sendo muito chata. Né? Por quê? Porque é, a gente vai para a escola e a gente tem que ficar lá. A gente treina os alunos para serem passivos. A gente mata... Todo mundo aqui já deve ter visto aquele vídeo do Ken Robinson falando que a escola mata a criatividade. Não é só a criatividade, mata o interesse, mata a vontade de estar lá, mata a curiosidade, mata tudo o que as crianças têm e quando chegam na escola elas são ensinadas a calar a boca, sentar, prestar atenção, copiar. Ou seja, elas são treinadas para serem passivas. Né? Enquanto que a gente quer no mundo... Pessoas que sejam protagonistas, que sejam empreendedoras, pessoas que sejam criativas. Ou seja, a escola tradicional, ela faz o oposto do que a gente deveria estar fazendo. Então a gente precisa de um novo tipo de escola, a gente precisa de um novo tipo de rede. E eu acho que as novas tecnologias têm super é, a ver com a, com a contribuição para isso. Por quê? Porque, poxa, os professores todos reclamam, ah, mas os jovens hoje não estão mais interessados. Aqui no Brasil, Marcelo sabe... A, o maior motivo do, do dropout das, da, dos jovens saírem da escola é a falta de interesse. Eles não veem significado, não, não veem por que estar tá na escola, não, não, é, não, não, não enxergam por que de estar aprendendo aquele tipo de coisa. Então, assim, tem que mudar tudo. Tem que mudar o currículo, tem que mudar a preparação dos professores, tem que mudar a escola em si, tem que mudar a cultura, tem que mudar... E é isso, assim, quando é que os alunos, as crianças e os jovens não piscam? Quando estão jogando videogame, <risos> como é que não dá para casar as coisas? Por que, que a gente não consegue casar mais o que as crianças e os jovens gostam de fazer com a educação formal que eles têm que receber? Claro que dá para fazer. Né? E as startups eu acho que tem é, muito a ajudar nesse processo da transformação da educação do sistema e da escola. E a gente está começando a fazer isso em sistemas é, formais. E eu acho que tem muita vontade hoje, inclusive, de governantes e legisladores de, de fazer essa transformação. Obrigado. Obrigado. E, Kai, 
both Rafael and Brian mentioned the importance of teachers to engage teachers in using technology and both uh, approach that from a policy point of view, from a general point of view. How did you do it in your school, your charter school, and how are you doing it in a more particular way? How do you engage with individual teachers to make that happen? To so, I think you can understand that, that all of us are stressing the importance of the classroom teacher. Um, when I started teaching in 2001, I really envisioned myself, even today, I'm still a teacher. And, and, if, and if, if our leaders aren't great teachers, our teachers aren't going to be great teachers. So what I did was took a lo long, hard look in the mirror and said to myself, am I the best teacher to my staff of adults that I have teaching my kids? So I really started to focus on my personal teaching ability, my modeling of what I wanted to see in my teachers every day. So I believe, one, the first step was modeling what I wanted to see. With that, I had to, like I mentioned, make sure that I had best practice and I was performing or I had knowledge of what the best practice was in the classroom. So going out across the country and even the world and looking at the top schools and the top teachers and learning from the best schools out there. One of my mentors when I was in my first year of teaching said to me, the way you become a great teacher is you go find a great teacher and then copy what they do. Until you get your own style, just do what a great teacher is already doing. Because since the beginning of time, there's been teachers and there's teachers that are successful. So if we can copy that, then we can start to duplicate the success in, uh, okay, in, in, in other classrooms, in other districts, and in other parts of the world. So when I found this best practice, I then had to bring it back to my staff. And I didn't hire someone to teach my teachers. I went out and got the training myself, and I delivered the professional development for my staff and modeled what I wanted to see them doing for their students. So when you came into a staff meeting that I was running, I ran it like it was a classroom. And I believe that by them seeing what I value, then they would start to see, okay, this is important. Mr. Adderley, when he comes to my room, is going to look for these specific things. And then the same thing with the teachers. With the teachers, I, I, I was able to, you know, with the, with the charter school movement, where we, a, we were able to have more autonomy. So with autonomy over my budget, I was able to provide my teachers with professional development. I could send them to a workshop in California or in Washington, D.C., or I could invite someone up from Washington, D.C. to present to my staff which was very important for the school leader to be able to have control over their budget and have control over hiring and firing as well. And unions is a whole other topic, but we won't yeah. get into that. Maybe Brian could talk to us about uh, how you deal with that at the district level. But, uh, you know, so it was very important that the staff was being trained at the highest level possible as well. So I took that experience and try and trying to bring that here to Brazil and thought partner with different organizations here to focus on teaching as the number one area to create change right you can have a class right here in the middle of this hangar and it can be the best class in all of Brazil if there's a dynamic <coughs> excuse me a dynamic and great teacher in front of them. So it doesn't matter the location, it doesn't matter if you're in a favela, it doesn't matter where you are, it matters the quality of the instruction. Thank you. Rafael, you had a comment on that? Yes. It's just uh, one thing that I, I think it's uh, important to mention that uh, I think we need to invest in changing the roles of teachers. You know, they can't see themselves as specialists anymore. You know, I, I think that now they need to see themselves much more as motivators and architects and curators and those who are going to help kids learn by themselves instead of transferring knowledge to right right 
So if we look at the past, teachers still saw themselves as specialists, people who had knowledge and had to transfer. Yeah. And today, I think this, we need to shift. We need to change the, the, the roles of teachers, especially with so much technology. Right. It's like everybody knows, you know, kids and us, we believe Google and we ask Google now right. everything. Exactly. Thank you. How about you guys? Is there any, any question from the from you that you want? Any comment? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, it's fantastic to see experiences like Rio and Washington, as you described. Uh, and, but how can we scale this kind of experiences where the, the, there's a self-teaching and uh, the teacher, our mentors, our curators, and things like this. How do we scale this kind of models and not, not only specific uh, projects and experiences throughout uh, the world? So I think there needs to be three things uh, in place, which are, for me, the most important one, the most important ones. First, we need to think about how uh, we're going to invest in changing the infrastructure. So we need to if we need to scale different models of schools, then we need to think that we're going to change infrastructure as well. If we're going to use technology, then we, you have to think about everything. You have to think about electricity. You have to think about outlets. You have to think about um, if, you know, um, y do you have enough internet connection to run stuff? You know, if all the kids are using internet, is it going to be enough? And internet in Brazil, you know, it's very bad, right? So. Number one, infrastructure, it needs to be appropriate. Number two, do the people in there want to change, right? If you want to scale, if you want a new model of school, do the teachers agree with that? Are they willing to change? Do they understand the need to change, right? Uh, and the third thing is teacher development. So you need, you need to invest in uh, they being ready and they understanding and developing the skills for change. So I think these three things are the most essential ones. Having the right uh, infrastructure, having people willing to change, and having them comfortable with change with the right skills and competencies. I agree with all three of those things. I will say that the, from my experience in DC, the scale happens when people see it in a classroom like theirs or a school like theirs. They rarely believe me that it can happen. They believe they're there are other teachers who talk to them and say, I did this, try it. Or the other school leader, the principal, who says, I did this, you should try it. And it's a peer-to-peer -peer conversation that really gets the scale going. I can talk until I'm blue in the face, and nobody cares. They want to see it and hear it from somebody who's done it. Okay. No, and Brian, I have a follow-up to that. How do, you sh how do you make that happen? How do you make that schools yeah. show to other schools what they're doing? Is that a policy process, a centralized no. process? It's mostly a structural process where we, need to, we only have, we have about 100 schools in Washington, D.C. So we, we have 100 school leaders. So it's about putting them into clusters, we call them, so they can w go and visit each other and see wh what is working and what's not. You know, we call them professional learning communities, but it would be all of the fifth grade teachers talking together, like both in person, and also we, we create those networks online where they're, they're sharing what works. They're uploading lesson plans that work. They're taking pictures, and they're sending them out on Pinterest or Instagram into their networks, and they're, they're, they're spreading within um, the city. That's how we get it done, structurally. Right, right. That's great. That's great. Kai, you want to add anything? You want to add anything? No. no. Any other questions? Yes. Go ahead. Uh, Adriana. Uh, I'll speak in English, so maybe Brian can help and add the U.S. point of view. As for Rafael, uh, especially what you said in Brazil, there is still a lot to do. And uh, it's more bureaucratic, and eventually our entrepreneurship spirit uh, is not as good as in the U.S. 
so I really think education is a long-term investment. So uh, it's nice to be creative like we are in Brazil and to have a lot of ideas. I think uh, I proposed a question in the morning. They said that the nice of no structure things is that you can propose everything. So it's nice. But if you don't really have a minimum coordination or long-term plan, uh, it's for nothing. So like uh, Claudia Costin seems to do an excellent work in Rio, but now we will have election, elections again. So how do we keep this coordination and in this long-term long -term view? I think, <coughs> sorry, I think we're, <laughs> we're talking a little bit about uh, politics, right? Um, and one of the worst things that we have here in Brazil, and I'm pretty sure it happens in many other places and in the U.S. as well, is political discontinuity and the discontinuity of um, policies, right? Um, I think, you know, uh, there are two things. I think it, it takes time for politicians to get more mature and understand that it's not because... I'm coming in now and I'm the best and everything in the past all the people were dumb and they did nothing intelligence so I'm going to you know put everything to the ground and I'm going to come with my brilliant ideas because I'm a genius right um, we need how to vote better right um, and another thing is I think we need to exert more pressure so I think we Brazilians are beginning to be more um, active politically and exert pressure on the governments and go to the streets and tell them what we want to continue. So if there is one thing that we, for example, Gente and Geo and Educopedia and many other projects, if, if, the, if the population and the teachers and the students want this stuff to continue, then they need to exert pressure, even if the mayor changes or the secretary of education changes. And so I think it's these two things. I think we need better politicians. I think some of them are good, but I mean, we need better ones in general. <laughs> and I think we need to exert more pressure and be more active politically. Can I just uh, yes. add, I mean, yes. I 100% agree um, and, and getting back to your question about differences that I see from working in New York City to working now in Rio, <clears throat> the pressure is not there. So if there's an idea that people want and someone says no, it's over. When, and, and in the movements of Teach for America and KIPP, you know, there were leaders that I looked up to that we got told no every single day. And then we just went home and created a plan to do it again, to do it tomorrow. And we got, you know, when I was principal, I organized buses of children and families, hundreds of buses. And we went to the state capitol and we sat there until the politician would come out and talk to us. You do that every weekend, send letters to their, to their houses and sit on their car, wait at their doorstep. They're going to have to give you an answer. And so the biggest difference was, for me, Brazilians weren't as upset as I thought they should be when I got here. You know, I, I didn't have the political history to know where the country is, but I was ready to go march as well because I see the need for change. And I knew that KIPP and Teach for America and a lot of the great, even in the districts now, you know, a lot of the great innovation came out of people telling Chancellors like Michelle Rhee and Kaya Henderson, no, you can't do that. And them saying, well, I'm going to do it anyway. And I have this hundreds of families, you know, behind me that believe it also. And we're going to continue that pressure, that pressure, that pressure. So, so I wouldn't point the finger at the politicians. I think we have to point the finger at ourselves, right? I was out at 6 a.m. in the morning gathering kids and families and we had leaders ed in the educational movement who were leading the way and if the politicians didn't it didn't matter because we still had leaders in the community that were leading the way and I don't, I don't know who those people are in Brazil I, I couldn't name them so I think there needs to be a, a face to the movement 
and, and it can't just be the families and the kids. There has to be someone that can speak at that pot, the pots on the government level and begin to make you know some of these changes. Brian, is there any yeah. great luck in Washington? Yeah. Quickly on this. Um, first, politics, same exact thing in Washington, D.C. In April, we have a mayor, the mayor's election, and mm -hmm. all of us are shaking in our boots to see what will happen. Um, but I think there's two other things. Second, we talk a lot about how much should we innovate and how much should we just keep doing what we're doing and do it very well, right? Like teaching kids how to read. Like there is a way to do it. Let's just keep doing it very well. So we actually think it's about 70% just keep doing what we're doing and then 30% always be innovating over here. And there's actually different people that we put on those. We say, you all, you're gonna do this work. Just do it very well. You all over here are gonna go sit in a room and think with the, all the startup people and be innovating and then bring it in over time. And then finally, I have in my office in DC a pile like this high of reports and uh, suggestions for how to make Washington DC a better school district because it's it was bad it was a bad bad district and in those reports there are lots of ideas lots and lots of ideas the problem was once I, an idea is chosen let's try what we saw in the video a, a new room with different space then you need the whole system to commit to doing it very well executing it and that means getting all the money lined up figure out where the power plugs are make sure that all the resources are there train people like really really do it because sometimes we say oh let's try it but we don't actually resource it or, or focus on it to actually try it so it looks like we're just throwing things away all the time please go ahead Hello. I try to make the question in English. So, uh, the question is for the American people. Uh, here in Brazil, usually the politicians, the poli politicians, politicians, they make the provide the public services for the people, but not for uh, for them. So it's a problem. I think they make they provide the schools, but the uh, the your kids are not in this school. So in USA is the same or not different? The public, the kids of politicians use the public school. I, if they use the public school, it's a better quality. It's possible or not? Very good question. Yeah, please. Okay. Yeah. So. I would say it's a lot the same, right? So, Wasn't that about Obama's daughters? yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so he's mentioning there was a discussion about uh, the President Obama and his daughters and <clears throat> what school they go to. They go to a private school in Washington, D.C. Um, D.C. is actually a great uh, area to, to have this conversation around. Um, from what I've experienced, there has been a shift in the last 10 years, I would say, where the pressure, that question has been asked a lot more. In the past, the history of the US, the elite sent their children to elite schools, period. That was it. Now, the, the difference was you could find elite public schools. There are districts that have public schools where are very, some of the best schools in our country. And this was traditionally the suburbs. You lived out in the richer and more affluent areas, you had better schools. And when you got to the cities, the inner cities, most people drove in, commuted to the cities for work and drove back out to the suburbs because the schools were better. Now there's been a movement, like in Rio, like I don't know San Paulo too well, to move back into the city, to be in the center of Manhattan, in the middle of Washington, D.C., and Philadelphia. So now affluent people are moving back into cities, and the first thing they're saying is, well, I want my children to have good schools to go to, or else I'm not going to move it back into your city. So there's been a lot of political pressure to, one, make the schools in the city better, because there's been a demand that affluent 
people and families want to send their kids to the public school. So there is a desire for it. And so with that desire, you, you're, you're starting to see some change. You're starting to see some CEOs and, and leaders of different school systems put their children in that district to say, if it's not good enough for my child, I wouldn't have them here. But if it's good enough for my child, it should be good enough for yours as well. So it's, a com it's very different from in Brazil because I understand here, if you're a person of uh, means, your kids go to private school 100%. And that has to change. That has to change. Brian, do you want to add any comment? No? That's good. Any other? Yes. Rafael. Five more minutes. Rafa, no, 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 no. I'm in charge of this panel. Um, we talk about uh, the need for change management for school principals and also for teachers. You talk a bit about the nice cases where, where it was easier to, to move them in that direction. I wonder if you can share with us some of the carrot and also the stick that you use in when there was resistance for a lot of these changes or teachers were not performing, particularly not in a charter school system, but in at a, a school district, both in, in Washington and, and in Rio. Can I start? So there's, um, there's been a, a number of not so pretty uh, experiences in DC. Um, quite simply, what we do is um, we work with the staff first, and then if it's not work, uh, we say this is not a good place for you to be teaching or you to be leading. There are lots of other schools and lots of other school systems, and we basically ask them after time to leave. Um, it is very important for, for us um, that we have a team of people who see where we want to go in education and not where we've been. So quite frankly, we've moved out of our 100 principals. We have 100 school leaders. When I got there in five years, there are only about 20 that are still with the system. 80 people over five years, we have moved out of their role um, because they, did not, they were not moving with the urgency um, that we needed them to, to move with. So for teachers, it's the same. Um, we, m we move out at the beginning of the reform, we moved out, we have about a thousand teachers and we would move out 200 for three years, 200 teachers moving out. Um, and now it's a little bit stable. We ha like have a good solid base. So we, we only move out about maybe 20 or 30, but it did, we moved out a lot and then we studied, um, either get on board or get off the boat. Kai, Rafael, do you have a, an answer on file and comment? É, eu, eu até concordo que a gente tem que é, evoluir na avaliação e, na, e até na demissão é, da, dos professores que não tiverem... É, porque aqui, aquilo, é, é, você está comprometendo a vida das crianças e dos jovens que não estão tendo é, uma educação de qualidade. Né? É, agora, eu acho que a gente tem que colocar no lugar também é, um processo de desenvolvimento profissional que seja personalizado para cada um também e que consiga dar apoio para o cara desenvolver as habilidades que ele não, não tem. Né? É, eu acho muito ruim pensar numa pessoa que não quer ser boa. Sabe? Às vezes ela não foi bem formada. E aí aqui a gente, no Brasil a gente tem essa questão de que é, os professores é, em geral... Não estou falando de todos os professores de novo, é importante falar isso. Agora, nos estudos que a gente vê por aí, é, em geral, os nossos professores não tiveram boa formação, desde o ensino fundamental. Então, como é que o cara vai ensinar alguém a aprender alguma coisa, se ele também não tem aquela habilidade? Então, antes de demitir, de pensar em demissão e tal, agora, todo mundo sabe que aqui não dá para fazer. O que, que acontece aqui? As melhores escolas têm os melhores diretores que pressionam, para que os professores façam um bom trabalho. O cara que não quer fazer um bom trabalho, ou não se sente confortável, ou não consegue, se sente pressionado e pede para sair e vai para uma escola onde a galera é mais tranquila e tem menos pressão, e tem menos cobrança e tal, tal, tal. Então, assim, 
as escolas boas têm bons diretores que trazem e atraem os melhores professores. E as escolas ruins acontece o movimento contrário. Thank you, Kai. A final comment? Sim, eu acho que English. <laughs> My Portuguese is not good enough for that, but uh, I think the quick answer would be, you know, you have to raise the expectations, right? So even in a charter school where I have the ability to hire and fire that day, you really don't have that type of autonomy. You will get some pushback. But if you raise the expectations and keep them there, right? Keep the expectations up. You know, and I don't know how many of those 80 that left DC, probably when they, when they got fired or they left, they probably said, whew, I was tired of doing that. That was too much work anyway. And a lot of them will deselect themselves out. So if you raise those expectations and keep them up there and keep them high, you'll see that probably 80% of the folks will just deselect oh, themselves out anyway. Thank you. Rafael. I just think that we also need to think about the incentive system, you know, because right now in Brazil we have teachers who, who are leaving the profession and we're going to the law or other stuff that pays more and there's not enough recognition and, you know, the number of young guys who are willing to be teachers is dropping sharply. So how can we make the teaching profession one that people are willing to go into, right? What's, what's the incentive system? How do we stimulate people to become better each day? Thank you, Rafael. Mais dinheiro. Thank you. Mais dinheiro. Thank you, Kai. <laughs> thank you, Brian. And thank you all of you for sharing with us this, this panel. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.